Uh, my name is Zach Powers. I'm the artistic director at the Writer Center. Uh, that means I get to help with a lot of events like this. So I'm really excited to be here this evening. And uh, this is the Writer Center's virtual craft chat series where we we welcome writers to talk a little bit more, of, a little bit less about what they wrote and a little bit more about how they wrote it. Uh, and it's really my pleasure today to welcome uh, our author and an interviewer. Um, so Sarah Fon Montgomery is going to be reading from her book here in a second. And then uh, Melissa, uh, Melissa, I forgot to ask how to pronounce your last name. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I will let you introduce yourself and your last name. I, I failed at one of my hostly duties. So please. No problem. It's Falavino. Falavino. I would have been right had I tried. But anyway, thank you so much for sharing that. And, and Sarah Fon, if I can pass it to you to do a reading, just so a sample of this book so that our, our guests today have an idea of what we'll be talking about for the next hour or so. Perfect. Thanks, Zach, and, and the Writers Center. And I want to say thank you to everybody who is joining tonight. My favorite thing about a virtual events like these is that everybody can come together from the various places that you call home. And we have this wonderful sort of collaboration happening online. Um, I'm just going to read a short segment from the book before we get into the good stuff, which is the craft talk. Um, I'm, I'm going to read from a section of my book called um, In Search of Nostalgia. This is a collection that's very much about um, you know, nostalgia and longing and trying to find your place in the world or find a place that you can call home when you're in the midst of emotional collapse, but also environmental collapse in, in the world that we're living in, climate change. This is In Search of Nostalgia. In the shaded grove, temperatures swell to 70. Warm enough that in winter we peel layers from our bodies like the bright-bellied lizards darting like shadows beneath our feet. We crouch beneath branches, make walking sticks of the broken bits, leave our soft prints on the moss-laden path. We don't need to go far to find no one. Solitude and space are easy to come by in our one-stop like town and most roads are dirt. Drive a mile in any direction from our high school and the rolling hills embrace you. Valley oak and interior live oak compete for space with the gray pine and manzanita. Their towering branches are the only skyscrapers we rural kids have ever known. We know nothing of cities and nature's scarcity because all the roads in and out of town lead to the beach. And in summer, we pluck poppies, clutch sunshine in our hands. This is why we do not fear poison oaks linking up the trees of our Eden, though it leaves more than one of us welted and red, pus sticky and miserable. It's easy to forget the fear of what might be when hummingbird sage blooms pink when blue lupin and yellow mustard dot the hills, when we go to the beach to line our pockets of sand dollars. Each day after school, we pile into one another's cars and drive a mile or so until the road looks just right. We park and leave our doors unlocked and walk into a field over a fence long slung low like our jeans. Yes, we kick at the dandelions, but that's only because we are wishing for college or a tank full of gas to drive out to the beach dunes, where we love how the earth gives way beneath us because we are not afraid yet to fall. We find a spot and sit in a circle under the trees, counting down until the last time we'll be like this. We gather every day after school to play a card game called magic, and maybe it is the way the creek sounds like laughing, which makes us feel like crying, or maybe it's because the sun has always made us feel like we can't sit still, like if we don't move, we'll burst. Or maybe it's because everything hurts so good at this age, in this place, and we want to linger a little longer. Graduation is coming. Soon we'll scatter, moving to places where we can't park, or at least not for free. Or we won't be able to look up and see moss strip from the trees. Or we won't be able to drive out to the eucalyptus grove in winter and see 10,000 monarchs nestling for warmth the whole forest rustling and alive. We'll spread out from the coastal heart of California to bigger places like San Francisco or Los Angeles and Fresno, which we know isn't glamorous, but has multiple stoplights illuminating the loneliness we'll discover there. For now, we sit in the woods, imagining worlds, making magic. We survived Y2K and are trying to figure out what the television says about weapons of mass destruction in a war we don't want, but also don't understand. Like when the guy who lost the presidential election says the climate is changing, even though here it never does, all golden warmth stretched out forever. Graduation looms, and with it the realities beyond our tiny town. But no one talks about that. Instead, we cling together in plain sight, storytelling between shadows and sunlight. Ever since I was a child, I felt a sweet ache at my core. 
the kind of satisfaction it left me swimming, unmoored at the same time I could not fathom being more fulfilled. I felt it while driving with my father in his beat-up pickup truck, the two of us bouncing on the stiff seats out to the dump. Every road is a back road when you live in the middle of nowhere, and each time we approached a dip, my father pressed his foot to the pedal and down we went, slipping into the dust, my tummy somersaulting with a delightful and confusing fear. The feeling was the same when I went camping with my parents and the trees looked familiar and foreign, making me believe I'd been there a thousand times before, but also wondering if I was misremembering. Sometimes I'd see a tree in a different park or at my elementary school and my tummy would drop with remembering I'd be happy and sad all at once. One feeling was green and another was blue and they swirled together until I wasn't exactly sure how I felt. When I was happy, I was also sad because every good thing had to end. The smell of applesauce made me miss my grandmother even when she was in the other room because she was aging right in front of me. And the Nestle quick she stirred up for me in tiny blue glasses was so sweet it started to sting. Often the surge would accompany memories of home, the smell of sawdust taking me back to my father's workshop, an empty pasture stretching seemingly forever, or the sun hitting the road right as an old song from on the radio. When I moved away to start my life somewhere else, convinced like many millennials that this fresh start would mean success, I missed home all the time. When I moved to Nebraska for graduate school, the sweet ache rarely came. Less often still, when years later I moved to Massachusetts to begin a job. I was so busy making my way in the world that I did not realize how quickly it had changed. By the time I stopped to realize, America was no longer the home nation I'd known, but instead a danger I could not fathom. A new climate and political control meant the country was now constantly on guard, our nation pulsing its many grievances. Everywhere was a throbbing hurt, and I missed the homeland of my youth like I missed my actual home, neither of which existed anymore. Thank you. I'm going to unmute to clap so that you actually get some applause. Yay. That was so beautiful. Thank you so much for that reading, Seraphon. I'm so glad you picked that uh, section. I was actually going to highlight um, those last lines as the lead into this, my first question for you. So I'm really, really glad that you read it. Um, that was gorgeous. And I just want to say that um, for those of you out there who have not read this book yet, please, please, please get a copy. It's beautiful. This is what it looks like. Um, it's just such a gorgeous collection. And I was talking to somebody recently about, um, the sort of like burden and gift of being asked to write blurbs. And that's something that, you know, happens a lot in the, in the literary world. And I'm always really happy to do it. And usually when it happens, I'm like, okay, this is good. This is good. You know, and then I'll write a few words and it's rare that. I get a manuscript um, to write some words about that I read and I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> uh, it hits so hard and it hits so home. And um, it's just a pleasure to, to be able to be here and talk with you tonight about it. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna jump in and ask a bunch of questions about um, the process of writing this book. Um, first of all, I just kind of want to start with this idea of writing into place and home and specifically into nostalgia, which is something that I think for a long time people resisted and in many ways still resist um, kind of admitting uh, uh, admitting to being nostalgic um, and, and certainly resisting writing into it. And I feel like your work in your work, you really lean in. And um, so I'm curious about um, a just sort of in general, the origins of this book, how it came together. And then B, sort of more specifically, the ways that you write into place and home, and specifically this idea of nostalgia and the longing to return to something that doesn't exist. Yeah, I thank you, first of all, for your lovely kind words. That's that means so much to me. Um, you're such a writer I respect, and, and your book has meant a lot to me personally. I always say it's the book I needed uh, as a teenager, and then the book I needed when I read it at that moment. Mm -hmm. um, for me, um, I, I wrote this book. I had been writing it probably for about a year uh, before the pandemic started. I've been playing with these ideas of, of home and writing essays. 
set in California and, and Nebraska, and I had just moved to Massachusetts, and so I was writing a few essays about Massachusetts. And then when the pandemic started, um, I had just purchased my first home. I was very fortunate to move into my first home in January of 2020. Um, and when, when the pandemic started, I really started wanting to write my way back. Um, I wanted to sort of write my way back to a time that didn't exist, um, maybe a time that never existed, right? Because nostalgia changes everything for us. Mm -hmm. I was trying to write my way back to places um, that I couldn't visit anymore and places that also didn't exist because climate change was was destroying them and, and they, they weren't going to be lasting much longer. I was watching them on, on the news. Um, California was always on fire and, and I knew that it wasn't going to be the same. Um, and then I was trying to also, I think, write my way back to myself. I was trying to write, I, I had lost myself and as, as we all do it at various points in our lives. And I was trying to find um, versions of myself that I missed or that I was that I was desperate to find again. And that's what kind of started it. Um, the themes of home are, are things I've written about a lot in, in some of my other books and things that have always, a theme that's always been something I return to. For me, home is a very, uh, it's been a very temporary thing. It's a very impermanent uh, thing. I'm, I'm from a very non-traditional family. I, I always tell folks um, there's eight siblings in my family. When the oldest was 50, the youngest was 15. Um, my parents adopted a lot of children and a lot of sibling groups. And so every few years, my parents would adopt again. And so the family structure was was always changing. It was constantly shifting. And my parents um, also took in a lot of children and, and families, um, you know, entire families that needed housing. So we would constantly have a shifting family unit. And my father was also in construction. So he would build rooms inside of rooms to house everybody so that everybody has space, um, which was lovely. And so as the family grew, um, everybody did have a space, but that meant that the walls were also closing in all around you and that um, the home that you grew up in was changing all the time and you didn't know where a door was going to open onto. Um, and so that's sort of been my family structure. Um, and I think like a lot of sort of Gen Xers, millennials, Gen Zers, I, I sort of bought into that narrative that to make your way in the world, you have to leave home. You have to move somewhere else and, and find yourself there and pursue a career there. And for me, I moved from California to Nebraska for graduate school, from Nebraska to Massachusetts to work as a professor. And so while I've made my way in the world and established my own sense of home in my new place, I'm as far from home as I could possibly get, right? I'm, I'm, there's a whole continent now in between me and home. And I think that sense of of wanting to go home, of having to leave home, even if you didn't, don't want to because you've been told you have to do so to make your way in the world is something that like, speaks to a lot of generations, a lot of different kinds of folks. Um, and that sense of nostalgia, I think, comes from wanting wanting that home, wanting that version of the self, wanting versions of the self that we had to let go of or that were erased for us or that we could, we could never be, lives we could never live. Mm -hmm. And I think Climate change is part of that as well, which is all wrapped up in this book, that our homes and our places are they're vanishing right before our eyes. We can't go back to them. We can't go back to ourselves that we were in those places. Um, so that's how the themes for me sort of come together um, and how I see them kind of interacting. Awesome. What a great response. <laughs> um, I love what you said about... Um, about sort of writing. Part of the impetus of writing this was to sort of write your way or find your way back to yourself. Um, and I feel like that's so much of what we do as essayists, uh, particularly, you know, memoirists too, but for some reason I find the essay to be this, this method for like digging and, and searching. And it's often digging into our own pasts and our own lives and our own stories to try to uncover ourselves or, you know, redefine ourselves or, or understand ourselves or know ourselves somehow. And, so much of the first essay in this book, Excavation, feels like that to me. Um, and there was just a, a, a passage, I was going through it before the event, just reviewing it, and there's a passage that I just want to point out. It's on page seven of the book at one of the, um, the, the first lines of, of this section. And you write, we bury the things we believe will define us after death. We bury ourselves for the future. In this way, we re we write the histories that will prevail, which is so gorgeous. Um, but I, I I was thinking about that, and I was thinking about this like sort of casting back into our own histories, and um, in some cases trying to uncover them, and in some cases trying to re rewrite them, like rewrite our own stories and narratives, and that is 
something that we're doing all the time through memory and trying to access memories of the past, um, our own memories of other people, our families, um, the people who were with us then. Um, and so I, I would just love to hear you talk a little bit about your process of writing into memory, um, which is different for everybody, I think, you know, memory is what we kind of rely on as essayists um, in so many ways. And yet, at the same time, it's so fallible and it's so subjective um, and it differs from one person to the next. Um, so I'd just love to hear about your process for digging into accessing and writing memory. Yeah, yeah. I think for me, like like most nonfiction writers, like most memoirs, I've always been fascinated with memory. Um, memory is something for me, it's a it's a craving, it's a compulsion, um, and it's a construct, right? Because memory, you can revisit it and you can build it into whether you know you're doing it or not, you build it into what you need it to be at that moment in time, right? So the same memory can be soothing or bittersweet. Um, it can be a, a moment where you feel most like yourself or a moment when you revisit it years later that you feel like you know you weren't yourself. And I love the way that it that it shifts on itself in those ways. And I have a lot of memories of, of being a child thinking about memory. So I used to, at the end of every day as a you know five or six year old, replay the best parts of my day over and over in my head. And I would do it so many times, I couldn't tell what was real anymore. And I loved, I loved that sense of not knowing. And, you know, if I had a bad memory, I would pack it into a box in my mind and, and put it away. And I could, I could forget it. I could make it almost disappear. And I'm, I'm so fascinated with the way that our brains do that. Um, for me, when I'm, when I'm writing and when I'm accessing memory, I, I do it in a couple of ways. The first is to sort of access a memory in different points in my life um, so that I can see the way that um, the story reveals itself to me. So for example, the essay that you're referring to, um, it starts off with digging in my childhood treasure hole, which I, I took a lot of joy and wonder as a child and, you know, finding pennies and rocks and you know, like an old rubber band in my, in my treasure hole. I loved it. And it was a really joyous experience for me. So I can write about that memory as a five or six year old, or I can write about that same memory um, from my 20 year old perspective when I realized um probably a little bit too late. I was very old when I realized this, that the treasure hole wasn't real. My father had buried all of those treasures for me. And so by revisiting that memory from that moment in time, I can rethink about my father, who's a very gruff construction man that still found these beautiful treasures on his construction sites and brought them home to give to me in the same way. Um, I can revisit that same memory um, when my father started to age, the first time I realized my father was aging and how that changes, or revisit that memory more recently when my father was diagnosed with cancer and I realized we didn't have much time left. So it's the same memory, but by visiting it from different perspectives or from different ages, the memory shifts and, and, and reveals different kinds of stories and different selves. So that's that's one way that I, I play with memory or, or access memory. Um, another way that I do that is by taking a memory or a moment and then trying to think of the other characters who are involved, and, and they're real people, of course, but um, think about how knowing them or empathizing with them reshapes the memory or re recasts the memory for me. So I write about addiction in a few of the essays in this collection. It's something that runs in my biological family tree and the biological family trees of a couple of my siblings. Um, and it's a very important part of our family narrative. And so I can write about, you know, being a child and not being aware that addiction was happening. I can write about recent moments from my adulthood that um, where addiction is very present. Um, but then that's too easy, right? That's, that's, it's boring. Nobody, I don't, I'm not learning anything that way. So then I can, I can think of my mother, right? A character involved in all of this and think of my mother's growing up and, and my mother's childhood was very much shaped by an alcoholic father and a lot of uh, the threat of violence, a lot of sorrow and loss. And that gets me to re-see my memories differently. I can revisit the experiences of my siblings and think about how abuse and, and trauma lead to substance abuse. And it broadens my empathy um, in ways that I couldn't um, access if I was just thinking of my own my own memory. Um, so those are kind of the ways that I play with it. And I also, I encourage most writers to consider what you don't remember. I think there's a lot to be said for the, the gaps or the silences or the erasures, whether they're intentional or not. Um, and I, I find I, I find a lot of rich storytelling in the things that we that we don't remember. You can you can tell a story from what you don't actually have access to in a lot of ways. And I'm always trying to to write about that. 
Yes, I love that. That's such great advice. And it's something I'm always trying to convince my students is interesting too. Like, no, just fess up that you don't remember and write into it. Like, tell me what I, I have this exercise where we start, don't remember, I don't remember. Yes. And they're like, how do I write about something I don't remember? And like, that's the question. How do you do it? Do it. Um, I love what you, I wrote, I scribbled down very quickly a quote, so I don't know if I got it verbatim, but you said, I think, I love the sense of not knowing, which is so well said and so perfect because I think maybe that's part of what separates essayists from non-essayists or, you know, maybe writers apart from people who don't write, uh, is this like, I think not remembering or not knowing brings a lot of people anxiety, you know, like the, the, the realization that we're losing memories or we've lost memories or that, you know, we're going to continue to lose our memories. I know that brings anxiety to a lot of people, but I think like some of us find that really fascinating and a really rich, a really rich territory to write into. And I, I tend to think that, I don't know, so much of it, like the part of that fascination is about that very process that you're talking about of like rebuilding our narratives and our, our own mythologies and our familial mythologies and trying to make sense of them that way. Um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote you at some point to my students, if you're okay with that. Sounds good. <laughs> great, great. Um, okay, so... Uh, another question I have for you, um, which is not unrelated to memory, is the question of distance, writing from distance. So this is something that people talk about all the time um, in across genres in writing that, you know, there's this sort of dictum that we have to have distance, great distance sometimes from something in order to write about it. And in many ways, I think that's true. Um, but I've been thinking, I've been talking with my own students a lot about it lately, and I've been thinking about it a lot in, in my own work um, about the things that sometimes can be served by writing from within a very sort of present question or experience or feeling, I guess. Um, and so I think in particular about writing place, um, I like like you you mentioned at the beginning, kind of I think when you were answering the first question, um, there's this sort of pull when you leave a place to write about it. I, I generally don't start writing about a place until I leave it, and then suddenly I'm obsessed with it and I can't stop writing about it. Um, but I guess I'm just curious about your relationship to distance. Um, do you tend to write more from great physical or emotional distance? Do you write from within? a place where a feeling um, and when and why? Yeah, um, this is something that for me, probably within the last maybe year or two has dramatically shifted. So for a long time, I wrote, I always wrote with, with distance. I needed to have distance. And I think when writing place, especially, it really just comes from my experience with place of, of making my home in a, in a state or a region of the country for a few years and then moving and, and you know, making a home when I knew I was going to be leaving um, to, to go somewhere else. And so when, when I was doing that, for me, getting to know a place uh, depended on that, that sense of impermanence. And so I, I fell in love with it because I knew I was going to be leaving it. And I think that there's something to be said for the way that invitation asks us to notice, right? We don't often notice things if we think that we have forever with them, but you know, you're gonna leave somewhere, you you notice the, the monarch grove in California where all, all the monarchs go every winter to, to keep warm, or you notice the fossil record of Nebraska, which is full of all sorts of wonderful sea creatures, which folks don't know about unless you love museums there and, and love fossils, or the scrimshaw shops out here in Massachusetts where there's, art that's made from literally carving a story into bone. Um, and so because if I, you know, if I know I'm leaving a place, I, I'm more mindful. I, I sort of gather up um, images and moments like a, you know, like an animal story them away for winter. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bit more mindful of, of appreciating, appreciating different moments. Um, I would say I, I used to do the same thing also when writing about emotions or questions or myself, I usually had to have a year or two in between when they happened and when I could write them. And that's because 
the situation, I, I'd have to live the situation, right? I had to experience the situation, finish living it before I could then create story from it. Um, and those are very, two, you know, two very different things, the, the situation of your life and the story that you try to tell from it. And it can be really difficult to do both at the same time. Um, but recently, again, in the last like, year, maybe two years, I've been writing um, in the midst of experiencing things. And I've been writing when I'm very new to plays. And I think the only reason I've been able to do that is because I've been incorporating more research into my work. And research gives me the distance that I need um, to move away from the self. And I love research with nonfiction um, because even though I write about the self and I write a lot of memoir, um, it gets me away from just talking about myself. It broadens out my story into larger sort of um, you know, theoretical or thematic networks and frameworks that I can use. Um, so research has been a wonderful way for me to do that. Um, I'll give an example of this from, from the collection. There's an essay in the collection about, it was written during the early weeks of the pandemic, honestly. And I, there was no way I could have written that essay because I was I was trying to make sourdough and like in the midst of collective trauma and grief, right? So I could never have written about the pandemic in the pandemic in that in those early weeks. Um, but I came across some wonderful research at that time. And it was research about the fungal networks in forests, right? And these networks that connect all different trees of different kinds of species. Um, and it allows trees to divert nutrients and resources back and forth to one another. So trees that are healthy and thriving will um, you know, distribute nutrients to trees that are that are suffering and, and that are weaker and that need that. And I love that idea of community because um, you know, one tree can't survive if the forest is not thriving. If I hadn't had that research, I wouldn't have been able to write about the pandemic and about our country's sort of non-response to the pandemic. Um, so the research, again, gave me the distance from the cultural moment. It gave me the distance from my own grief and, and the way that I was processing things. And it allowed me to write um, from the midst of it, even though there was just something about that, that lens or that, that layer in between me and the moment. And I've been doing that more and more um, recently. And I like it. It's, it's a different mm -hmm. approach to it. Yeah, I love that. I love, I love that example, too. And the metaphorical power. I find that like one of it's one of my favorite things about writing essays is the research process and that sort of magical moment that just keeps happening. And I'm gonna keep having faith that it'll continue happening and that it won't stop at some point. But that, you know, that moment when you're researching and something just you stumble over something and you're like, this is it. This is the connective tissue I've been looking for. This is the metaphor that I've been searching for and haven't been able to find. And it's like total magic when that happens. Exactly, yes. <laughs> so good. Um, awesome. So I would love to just talk a little bit about the form of the lyric essay with you. Um, so um, I'm curious about, you know, your process for, for composing a lyric essay, um, what the process looks like to you. I know you're a poet as well. And um, hearing you read aloud is actually really lovely um, because you can you can hear the, the lyricism and you can hear the rhythm in this work when you read it on the page, but hearing it aloud also, like I was just struck by a lot of the rhyme and the rhythm and um, the internal slant rhyme was really cool too. Um, so if you could just talk a little bit about your process of, of writing lyric essays, what that form what the form of the lyric essay means to you, maybe how it differs from your process as a poet or how it intersects. Yeah, so um, with, with lyric essay, I always often think of lyric essay as operating. Um, so a narrative essay would ask you to um, rely on you know, plot points, right? It's not, not to say that a narrative essay doesn't have you know, theme that it's working with, right? Whenever I write memoir, um, memoir always has, my story always has some kind of larger thematic element that I'm trying to reach to readers with and, and connect through that shared experience. Um, but when readers read narrative essays, they're waiting for the author to give the next sort of plot point and then the, the subsequent reflection. And that's how you navigate yourself through an essay. With lyric essays, um, they often don't rely on, on plot points as much. Narrative can certainly be involved, but they're more about evoking an emotional experience or an intellectual experience. Um, and you can do this through um, you know, evoking emotion through image. Uh, you can do it through juxtaposition. So putting different pieces that that either work together or contrast greatly or, or contradict one another. Um, you can braid things together or collage. Um, I love collage and mosaic where you 
take small parts that are kind of related sometimes, they don't have to be, and then you build this larger picture with them. And by the time you finish the essay, you have all these parts that are that are telling this greater whole. Um, and so again, it's a uh, lyric essay. It doesn't rely on the author to tell the next plot point as much as uh, it relies on the reader's involvement, which is probably my favorite thing about lyric work, because there's an invitation in lyric essays that invites the reader into the moment. So if you're using segments, for example, you've got blank space, so silence, erasure, absence, pause, whatever thematic, you know, you know, uh, moment you want to give it, and it invites the reader into that. The reader has to read themselves into that moment, um, and the question that you're doing in a lyric essay, um, the, the sort of emotional journey you're taking yourself and the reader on, the reader can insert themselves into that and try to figure out what you're doing, and sort of a, an invitation to to discover along with you. Um, so that's sort of how I see the two of them sort of, they're similar, but they're not. Um, I like to mix them together. So in this book, there's there's some essays that are memoir, right? There's an essay in the book about uh, picking berries with my family as a kid um, and thinking about how um, we experienced a lot of food um, insecurity when I was growing up. Um, but looking back and going, oh, look what my parents were able to do. Like they said, they made something from nothing. They fed us from these berries we were able to find. And that's just straight narrative, right? That's that's memoir. I think it's I think it's good. Like it's a good straight mm -hmm. narrative. But mm -hmm. then there's essays that I that are very lyric. So um, there's an essay about you know mirrors and self perception and what does it mean to see yourself in a mirror what does it mean to take a photograph how do we how do we perceive ourselves how do we perceive ourselves as a nation what are the images of america that we are capturing right now um and that's very lyric that's using research and there's some narrative moments and there's some questioning that happens um and so i love that interplay between um you know more narrative moments and more lyric moments i would say the the unifying thing between the different kinds of, of essays in this collection is probably an attention to image mm -hmm. and an attention to, to sound. I love sound. And that just comes just from my love of poetry in general. I love, I love poetry. I think every prose writer needs to read mostly poetry. Um, mm -hmm. And I tend to think of genre as pretty fluid, right? It's, it's, it's a construct like everything else. Um, and so I often will write, the same about the same topic or the same image um, in multiple genres at the same time. So if I'm writing, um, you know, a piece about the Midwest, I'm writing a poem about the Midwest and also writing an essay at the same time. And the difference for me, the only difference really, because they use the same the same techniques. There's persona in both. There's image in both. The difference is the framing for me. So. I'm writing a poem about the Midwest. I want the reader to move inward. I want them to move closer towards um, a small moment or a small detail. So if I'm writing a poem about the Midwest, it's going to be in Nebraska. And it's mm -hmm. going to be in Red Cloud, Nebraska. And it's going to be in a particular stretch of prairie in Red Cloud, Nebraska. And then it's going to be a particular set of grasses. And then actually, I don't want to talk about the grasses. I want to talk about the grass roots because those stretch two to three times longer underground than the grass at the surface. And that's where all the nutrients are. You could burn a prairie down and there'd be nothing at the surface, but the roots will come back and the entire prairie will, will regrow. And that's that sort of you know, movement inward in the poem. If I write an essay about the Midwest or about Nebraska, I want to move out. I want to expand. I want the reader to explore beyond the images that I'm offering. So if I'm underground with the roots, the best part of the grass, um, I'm thinking about what are the, what's the soil composition? Um, what are the fossils that would have been found in this place? What do those fossils tell us about glaciation periods and different ecosystems? What do the ecosystems tell us about human history and ways that human history has either helped or harmed this region. How can we broaden that out? And what does that tell us about living through like our current cultural crisis or our, our you know, sort of current collapse? And, and what can prairie grass teach us about um, struggle and then ultimately survival? Because that's what prairie grass does. So again, the poem moving inward, the essay moving outward. And so that's for me, the only thing that genre does is it's re- it's reshifting the focus um, and it's it's sort of a, a movement in or out or a zoning in or out on different elements. Yeah, awesome. So well said. I love the idea. I mean, to me, the essay is all about expansion as well. It's, I mean, probably uh, <laughs> to a fault on my end because I end up writing like 10,000 word essays and people are like, can you maybe try to shorten this a little bit? And I'm like, no, I'm sorry. I've just I got- a long essay. <laughs> 
Well, and that and and that process I think is really unique too. The because to me, an essay, the process of writing an essay is all about that expansion, and and, and the way it expands is through research and association. That we're constantly making these associations and then following the association. Like I, if you, if you're making some connection in your brain, I say follow it. You know, even if you don't understand, especially if you don't understand what why that connection exists like why a and b are connected in my memory or in my mind follow it see where it takes you it's going to take you somewhere else and then it's going to take you somewhere else and that's the glory of it too like and then you end up with this you know sometimes giant pile of stuff and you're like how do i make sense of this um which if I could just ask a, like a bit of a follow-up question on your process too, which is kind of related to that associative expan expansive work. Um, I would love to know a little bit more about how you kind of um, see and work your way through a collage or a braid. Um, maybe how those themes, you know, if they come about through research, for instance, how you decide which elements to kind of uh, work into your piece, which which threads to follow, which ones to maybe cut. Yeah, yeah. What does that look like on the page to you? Oh, I love that. I I I, I love the, like prompts around lyric essays. I find them like lovely little puzzles. Um, I'll give I'll give a sort of a prompt or a, a way that I I do collage or mosaic. I use it almost every time that I that I write mosaic or collage essays. It's my favorite thing right now. I'll get bored of it. Um, but. So I'll give you an example from, from the book. I have a, a book, I'll, you start with your topic basically. So I have a, an essay in here about time. I, I've never liked time. I think we don't have enough of it. I think it's boring. I don't wanna have to look at the clock all the time. I remember getting mad as a kid having to learn to tell time. So you start with whatever topic it is that you want to write about. And then the first thing that you do, that I do, you can try it. Uh, the first thing that I do is I brainstorm any, any recent memory or any recent experience that I have with time. Um, and this can be really basic. So notifications on my phone, um, mm -hmm. calendar alerts coming up, um, the clock on my you know TV or my microwave, um, daylight savings, because we're all shrouded in darkness right now. It'll be a long time before the sun comes back. Um, the countdown to New Year's. Okay, so you've got a couple of different examples of recent time. You pick whatever ones you feel like writing about. Okay, you don't have to do them all. And I just write maybe two paragraphs. And I don't worry about theme. I don't worry about any kind of narrative arc. I'm just writing about New Year's Eve. I'm just writing about how I hate phone notifications. So after I have that, then I want to create some kind of um, movement. I love movement in an essay. So I can't just have present tense um, sections about time. Then I go back to childhood and I just brainstorm any example I can think of where clocks were involved from my childhood. Learning to tell time, taking those awful time tests in school that were terrible and nobody liked. Um, Tamagotchis, right? Where this, those um, eggs would buzz at you and tell you that you needed to feed your fake animal. Um, Y2K, which was the first time that the world was supposed to end in my lifetime. And there's been a half a dozen since. Um, so, and you brainstorm again, um, another example, um, being afraid to sleep. As a little kid, I was always counting down till bedtime because I was afraid of the dark and I didn't want to sleep alone. I was lonely at night. Um, and so then I just pick, you know, which ones sound good to write about two paragraphs. I'm not going to write too much. It's not going to be too long. Don't worry about plot. Don't worry about theme yet. Um, and then research, because that's my favorite part of anything. And so I just sit in my sweatpants on Google and I research clocks and time. So what were the first clocks? Um, when were pendulum clocks invented? What's that clock that Jeff Bezos has in the mountains of Texas? And why is it going to outlast humanity? Why do we even need a clock if humanity is dead? Um, the doomsday clock, right? Because that's scary. Um, and my favorite, because I love space, um, the notion that in space, time doesn't even exist, right? If you go high enough, clocks don't even work, time dilation. So then you pick whatever ones out of there you want to write about, write a couple paragraphs. And then the best part that comes after that, Tetris, right? You sit on the floor and start shuffling your sections around. And there's not a right or wrong narrative arc for this because you're not writing a linear narrative arc. You're not writing um, a triumphant recovery arc. You're not writing anything that you have to fit your form into. So you could put this in any order that you wanted. Um, so you're just trying to build different associations. So do you want to start with being afraid to sleep at night as a child? Or do you want to start with 
the time that I broke the clock in school because I didn't want to, I didn't want to, you know, follow the clock. So I just broke it. I, I, I touched it and ruined it. Um, so playing around with the placement can shape things a lot. And once I have an order that works well enough, because you can have four or five different ways to organize it, I go back and I try to um, strengthen transitions through an like, image or a repeated line. So for example, being afraid to sleep as a kid at night, um, I was always looking out the window at the moon. Well, the moon also appears in um, the time dilation space moment, right? So then all of a sudden I've been able to make a connection between being afraid of the dark as a kid and um, you know traveling around space with a clock, right? And so you just add these little moments in, in different sections to try to build threads or to build common images. So another example would be, you know, waiting for hearing the clock tick while you wait for Y2K to happen and then it didn't mm. happen. And then hearing the clock tick while you wait for the doomsday clock to finally reach zero and for humanity to end. Um, and then you just re you use those repeating images to strengthen, strengthen. So that's one of my favorite techniques. I don't know how well it works, but it's a lot of fun. <laughs> I love that. And I totally, I subscribe to the same method, literally putting it on the floor, sometimes just printing out all of the pages. Yes. Even if there are like 30 of them, uh, I hopefully will have a big enough floor space. And sometimes if it's a smaller piece, you know, of vignettes or, or a braid, I'll cut the pieces out and then literally just move them around at random. And then, you know, it's a, it's an instinctual it's a feel thing but it's also a balance thing and and making sure that the the you know if you're braiding something or collaging something that there's you know an adequate amount of each thread mm -hmm. and we don't spend too too long on one thread you know but i i love that process and i always like seem a little insane when i'm doing it you know and just in the best way <laughs> in the best way possible just you know like yeah um, always in my sweatpants, actually. Um, so um, the I, I know we're kind of closing in on time here already. Wow, time flies when you're having fun. But um, uh, before you get to the revision process, before you start to figure out order or how things are going to be moved around, when you're starting an essay, um, this is something that my students have been asking me a lot about recently. How do I start? Where do I start? With what do I start? And usually I go, I go to image, you know, if, if there's a sort of idea or a theme that you're working around, think of one image and start with that image and go from there and let those associations follow. Um, but, you know, other, other sort of options are an anecdote or, um, you know, a, a scene of dialogue or something like that. Um, but I'm just curious how you tend to start an essay, where you start with what um, and where it goes from there. Um, I would say when I'm when I'm starting an essay, I'm always looking for the idea first. Um, I tend not to start with a memory first. I, I, a lot of my my essays are not driven by um, remembering something. I'll I'll walk past a mirror and go, oh, I hate mirrors. And mirrors are, mirrors and images are, are terrible. Or clock. Oh, I don't like clocks. And that'll that'll be the thing that I start with. Um, I'm also somebody who loves to collect facts. I love to like gather information and. It in my pocket for later and so some of the essays in this collection started off with gathering you know a fact about you know the fungal networks and forests that connect the trees or um nostalgia right um one of my favorite facts about nostalgia is that when it was created when it was um you know first sort of envisioned and talked about and first came to the lexicon it was um, a mental illness <laughs> it wasn't something that was considered to be sweet or wonderful it was something that was it was pathologized and to be nostalgic was to to get very ill and and people were discharged from the military and, and believed to um to die from it to be cursed by it um so if i have a lovely fact or something that i want to play with um I, I tend to start with the idea or the fact first um very rarely does a, a memory give me an idea for an essay once i have the fact or the the idea then i always go to image the image is the hook for an essay. And I want images to be delightfully surprising, um, playfully confusing. I want a reader to read an image and go, oh, what, like, what is this? And I want them to be curious about it. Um, and if an image in the opening couple of lines, you know, an essay or a couple of paragraphs is not, you know, delightfully confusing, if it doesn't make me confused and interested and intrigued, I know it's not going to do that for the reader. Um, so I'm always trying to, to have that surprise in, in the opening couple of paragraphs. Um, and then with essays, I often think of the first page or two as a kind of 
right? You're a cartographer as an essayist, right? You're making your map making or you're building a world. And just like with a map, you have to teach the reader and yourself essentially how to read that. So you have to have the legend, you have to have a sense of scale. How big is the story? How much of the story are you going to tell? Um, you have to have directions, right? How do you navigate through a story? Do you start at the end? Are you are you moving linearly? Are you moving up and down? Um, and so I think of essays that way as well. So when I'm first getting started, I get my, my image as my hook, and then I try to lay out the, the groundwork of the, the cartography of the essay and figure out how I'm going to map my way through. Because if I don't, that I'm lost, the reader's lost, and it doesn't mm -hmm. work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, um, I, the, the, the opening lines of, of this book are, are such a striking image about the, this, this wooden horse and the, the way you describe it is so, um, so vivid and so tactile. And, um, I just love that opening image and it, it's certainly a hook, you know, it's like, well, okay, what, do, what I find is, is how this essay starts. And then we go from there. Um, so thank you for that. So we're getting some questions in the chat. I just want to make sure we leave some time for yeah. questions. Is that cool? Okay. Um, should I'll just do you want me to um, moderate some of the questions that are coming in? Or I do you want you, I'll grab one or two of them out of the, out of okay, the chat. Great. Yeah, I'll yeah. just kind of work my way down. So which essays do you read or inspire you with your writing? Um, I always tell folks I read mostly poetry. I, I love poetry. I, I consume poetry like feverishly. So um, Writers that I love, Ocean Wong, um, Chen Chen, Dana Smith, Torin A. Greathouse, um, Dorothy Chan, Mider Vang, um, the, list, the list goes on and on. I, I read a lot of poetry. Um, I try to read a book or two a week. Um, it's, it's a delight and a joy. And, I, um, and I, you can read it fast, you can read it slow, you can read it in the tub in between classes. It's just, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. And, and I, I, again, I, I think every prose writer should read more poetry. Um, I'll go to the next one. How do you organize your gathered facts and favorite resources that help you or writers stay organized? I'm a terrible organized person. <laughs> I, I, I jot things down in notebooks and lose them. I, um, I put them in different files and they're all over the place. Um, I tend to I gather things, which sounds kind of odd. I, I love to gather things in nature. So I'm always, I love rocks. I'm always picking up a rock or a gemstone. I've got a bunch of gemstones up on my wall right in front of me. Um, and learning about that, those kinds of things will allow me to, to collect facts. If I'm collecting rocks or pine cones, I'll, I'll learn from those. Um, the other thing that helps me, I think, sort of organize facts is sharing them with other people. So um, if I've read some kind of scientific article, I'm telling you, if, you're, if you work next to me, if your office is next door, I'm coming over to share that with you. Um, and the more you share it, the more it becomes embedded in your memory, right? Like it's yeah, the act of sharing and storytelling in that way um, helps me to keep track of facts. But um, but I'm a terrible writer. I, I, I don't actually have an organizational system for them at all, quite fleeting. Um, and then let's see, I love writing lyrical graded essays. There are so few places that enjoy publishing such essays. Do you have any suggestions of where to send or attempt publication? Yeah, um, I would say the Bellingham Review, I love. I love the lyrical work that they that they do. Um, Southeast Review um, published one of the essays in this collection. Uh, New England Review published one of my strangest essays. I, I was so delighted when they took this strange lyric essay about um, gender and flooding and Noah's Ark and the pandemic and animals. Um, let's see, other places for lyric essays. I feel like a lot of our folks are starting to embrace lyric writing. I'm seeing a lot more essays appear in, um, in mainstream journals. Fourth Genre, I think is publishing lyric work, Ninth Letter, um, Missouri mm -hmm. Review. Yeah. Oh, Scrivener, yes, there we go. Great place to collect information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that those are probably all the questions I see in the in the chat, if anybody else wants to throw a question in there, or Melissa, you can ask another one if you want. We have a few minutes. Yeah, I would love to open it up for these last few minutes if anybody else has questions. Uh, otherwise, I'll just keep geeking out with Sarah Fawn. <laughs> um, I don't know if we want it to be subjected to more geekery, but I guess <laughs> that's what we're here for. It's a craft talk. <laughs> can geek away. Um, there's another one that just rolled in about how you block time for writing. Oh, I would, I would love to answer that one. Um, 
I always tell folks, um, writing for me depends um, on my body. I'm a disabled writer. I deal with chronic pain and um, writing for me is not, it does not work the way that it used to um, before I had such bad chronic pain. Um, and so for me, writing, um, it goes against a lot of conventional writing advice. So writing it write every day, write for an hour, write 500. I can't do that. So like, there's some days where I, oh, I got three sentences in me. I might have a paragraph in me. Um, so for me, I, I try to reframe the way that I think of writing. It's been very helpful for me the last few years. And so thinking about writing is writing, right? So if I'm in too much pain to write that day, if I have a migraine, if, 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 my, if I have my body spasms and I just can't write, I'm going to think about it. I'm going to think about my ideas. And that's a kind of writing that process work. Um, I write in short segments. So I will find um, like pockets of found time. So in between classes, I can write for 15 minutes. Um, I can write for, you know, 10 or 15 minutes um, at a desk sometimes. Um, I often write in places that are not uh, conventionally uh, academic spaces to write in bed, on the ground. <laughs> um, I move around a lot because of, because of chronic pain. I can't sit still in one spot for very long without being in a lot of pain. Um, and that has impacted the way that I write. So lyric writing is wonderful for that because if you only have small chunks of time um, as a disabled writer in which to produce the work, lyric writing lends itself so wonderfully to that. I can write two or three paragraphs at a time and that's an entire segment for a lyric essay. Mm -hmm. And so writing lyric essays has also been about um, learning to write as a disabled writer and learning to write um, you know, through and with and because of chronic pain. Um, so that's been something that's helpful for me and not, not being too serious about it. I don't write every day, I don't write every week so, or every month sometimes. I write when I can, I write when I want to um, and, and when my body allows it. Oh, a dictation app. Yeah, I, I use um, Dragon Speak. I use I use Dragon Speak to type everything. I'll handwrite everything, um, and if I'm not able to do that, I use Dragon Speak. Um, that's a great question. Um, let's see. Ooh, the topics. That's a good question. When okay. it comes to topics, I'm braided. Oh. Are, 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 is there a too many? <laughs> no, I don't. I tend to do three. I'm someone that loves symmetry. Three topics is all I'll tackle. Maybe a fourth one, but I I've never tried doing more than three or four how about you melissa do you ever do more than i think i've done more um but it, it does tend to get unwieldy and mm -hmm. and like and i and i realize that i do this sometimes only after a thing has been published and then i, I attempt to sort of contextualize it to an audience i'm like it's about this oh but it's also about this and this and this and this and that is far too many topics yeah. um, but you know there usually a few of them tend to get the get the axe throughout but i think three is is perfect honestly yeah. I, I like i like three as well i always tell my students i'm 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 lazy and efficient right I, three is good i don't need to do five or six i don't want to have to show off that much three three <laughs> things that i can move between and, and ship and turn on is is enough for me maybe a fourth one if i'm feeling brave that day but keep it simple <laughs> At a certain point, it just feels like you're bragging when it's, you know, when it's five or more, it's like, you know, are you going to land this? Are you going to connect all of these? Watch my next trick. <laughs> um, let's see. I'm looking at, I think we have probably have time for one final question. Do you ever start to dislike an idea you had? Do you keep working on it? Do you abandon it? I, I love that question. I always tell folks I have commitment issues to mm -hmm. places, topics, foods. Um, I'm very flighty. I like to try different things. I like to go where the um, the dopamine is, right? Um, so yeah, there's definitely times when I'm working on an essay that I don't want to continue it. And sometimes I force myself to do it because I know that I can, right? Sometimes not wanting to do it doesn't mean that I can't do it, right? I know that I can finish it. Um, and there's definitely some times where I know I'm not ready to write about a particular topic. I write about um, trauma and the body a lot. I write about um, domestic violence a lot and addiction. And there are some times when I don't want to do that anymore. And then the essay goes away. Um, sometimes it comes back. Sometimes I, I leave it all together. Um, I try to finish most of the things that I write, but there's definitely you know, essays and, and book drafts that I've that I've put aside. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that because the process of trying to write that led me to my current project. Um, so I don't know how helpful that is um, for folks. Ooh. Your favorite way to end an essay. I love that. Let's do that. Yeah, the last the, the yeah. last question for our Zoom. Um, your favorite way to end an essay, when are you done, done? 
Uh, for me, it's it's a feeling, right? And I, I think as writers, we feign modesty, but you know when you've written something good, right? Like I think all of us know when there's just like a good line or a good image. And so when you get that feeling um, that something that something is right. Um, and the other way that um, the other way that I that I end an essay is by telling myself I'm done um, mm. because the inclination to keep revising things over and over and over again and to not share them with the world or risk the vulnerability of submission is really great. And a lot of folks will sit on something for forever or edit the spirit out of something um, by playing with it too much. And so sometimes an essay is done because I feel it and I, and I know it's I know it's good and I, and I feel really proud of it. And sometimes an essay is done because I tell it. We're done now. We're we're breaking up. It's time for you to to go into submittable somewhere. Um, the first one feels better, but the second one also works. Awesome. Thank you so much for all of your insight and um, beauty and brilliance tonight, Sarah Fawn. Um, I just, I'm going to give you a round of applause. Thank Don't you all for the questions too. <laughs> Thank you all for coming out. This was wonderful. I enjoyed talking with you all. Thank you both so much for doing this. It was nice to so many, so often I'm hosting one of these or or moderating in some way, and it was nice to just get to sit back and enjoy one for once. So thank you so much for uh, uh, coming together and doing this for us. This was absolutely wonderful. <laughs>